Grazie per l'invito, uh, sono felice di essere qui in, uh, nella bellissima città di Pisa. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Better. Ora parlerò inglese, se tutti italiani. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me here, thank you for the invite, Culture Labs, uh, the Internet Festival, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I am a, a lecturer at the University College Cork and I was asked for today to think about what our digital futures will look like. And that's an interesting challenge for someone like me that works in this space about people and technology for more than 10 years now. So um, I have some thoughts, but I want you to also think about that. I want you to think also about what your digital futures what would you like them to be looking like? So, let's see. So, we all know that our world today is mediated with technology. You know, pretty much every single aspect of our lives, from our, you know, uh, communication, our healthcare, agriculture, our education, um, entertainment, pretty much every aspect of our life has a digitized aspect, either partially or fully digitized. But what is more interesting is that how these kind of technologies now are becoming more and more connected. So they are kind of talking to each other, exchanging data with each other, uh, data about you know, their use, but also about their users, that is us. So, so that is kind of an interesting aspect, and this is kind of something that I'm thinking a lot about because it was also announced, so recently I read that by 2020, and that's like in a year's time, right? 50 billion uh, devices will be interconnected. 50 billion devices will be talking to each other and exchanging data and information about all sorts of things. So, so that's something to think about. And to be fair, like I'm not one of those people that say, oh, technology is that kind of evil entity. Technology has done a lot of good things for us. Like it has helped our economy advance. It has kind of, well, provided, improved our healthcare, accessibility, education. Uh, it has kind of relieved us for quite a lot of boring stuff and gave us time to have do more fun stuff, I guess. Uh, but with this kind of, the more this technological innovation is expanding, the more we are starting now to see uh, some of the side effects of it, some of the kind of the, you know, the evil aspects of the technology. And I don't need to say too much about that. We are seeing more and more in the news around us how technology is blurring the lines about what is real and what is not. Uh, it is also blurring a lot the lines about what we own, what is ours, and what is not. So this is kind of an interesting thing because if you think about it, when the internet started, the vision was really about uh, providing access to, pe to information to people, access to information that you couldn't have otherwise, access to other people and cultures that were maybe far away and you couldn't kind of reach. It was all about taking the power from the few that had the know-how and kind of giving it to the many. And now it's kind of the opposite. What we have now is four, maybe five big tech monopolies, technological monopolies that are owning all these different kind of aspects of our lives and we have no control. Uh, so, so this is kind of the, the bad thing, I guess. And actually I wanted to say, if you're interested in kind of finding out more about this kind of four big monopolies, uh, Scott Galway has a great, great kind of keynote that is kind of talking about these four monopolies and how they're tapping into our basic needs, how they're tapping into our instincts. So Amazon, you know, tapping in, into our consumptive kind of instinct, getting more things for less. Uh, Facebook, tapping into our need and ability to connect with each other and to love each other. So, and it's kind of showing how these big technologies are maybe manipulating a lot of our needs. And the problem is not so much the big tech. The problem is that these big technologies, these big kind of companies, sorry, uh, they're not driven anymore by the people's needs. They're not driven by what we need, by what we want, by the people's will. They're driven by shareholders 
profit. And that's where I see kind of a lot of the issues with our, with our present. So, and for someone like myself that I've spent pretty much, like I said, uh, more than a decade now working alongside communities, alongside people to design technology, to understand how they use technology in their everyday lives. This is a big problem for me. So when I think about the future, I am thinking a lot about that, and I'm thinking a lot about what kind of future I really want to have, what kind of future I want our children to have. And I talk about this a lot with my students as well, and we talk about all the evils uh, that technology is doing and all the good as well. And what I say to them is that technology is actually a product of our society. So it is the design of technology is shaped by uh, how we use technology, it's shaped by how we design as well technology. It's shaped by our values uh, and, and the values of those who design it, but the values of those who use it as well. So what this means is that as users of technology, so and if you're designers even more so, we have the capacity but also the responsibility to change that if we're not happy with it, of course. So if we're happy with how things are, that's absolutely fine. But if we are not, we have the capacity to change that. Technology is shaped by how we use it. They wouldn't be designing like that if we didn't use it. So that's kind of one of the things I want us to kind of think today. And that's kind of what I, I want to um, talk a little bit about how I see the future, what would be my ideal future, I guess, and kind of invite you as I'm talking to think about what would you like your future to look like, and then we can think about how we can make it happen. So, sorry, I have some, some issues here, but I'm gonna fix them. So I think we can do better. That's kind of the positive thing today. I think we can actually do better, and we are already doing better. I, we heard a little bit, you know, we heard about the Culture Lab project, we heard about the orchestra. These are exactly the kind of things we want for our future, for our digital future. And it doesn't all have to be digital, by the way. I mean, the orchestra, it was supported, okay, by the social uh, networks eventually, but it didn't start like that. It started with this kind of face-to-face. -face. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with keeping some of the things offline. So we can do better and basically, what my future, what I want my future to look like is to kind of put people back as the priority. I want to put people back to the forefront of how we design technologies to have the design of technologies to be kind of uh, founded in everybody being able to have a say and participate in that design to be returning back to our lived experience to how we live our lives and think about that. I would like to see the control to come back to the people, uh, to kind of grassroots movements, and I would like to see this kind of market and profit innovation to be replaced with grassroots innovation. And finally, but not last, I would like to see us design for kindness and empathy. I would like us to start kind of, well, to continue or start thinking about the technologies that can help us care for each other again, or, or continue to care for each other. So, so uh, I'll start a little bit with kind of talking, uh, what I've done is I'm gonna be showing some of these futures, but a lot of these projects are actually present, but help us kind of think about the future. So um, the first thing I think, the first ingredient of this kind of digital future is about uh, changing, like I said, changing the way we design, our approach to design. And it was great, you know, being in this session, it, there was already conversation about participatory approaches. And that's exactly kind of what I have here, is basically thinking and pushing for, sorry, that was the wrong one, <laughs> uh, thinking and pushing more towards like us as users and uh, to be included more and more into the design of technologies. And we have approaches that do this. The participatory kind of approaches, the uh, experience-centered design approaches are doing exactly that. They're focusing on how we can design together, how we can include all stakeholders, direct and indirect stakeholders into the design of technologies. And they are placing a lot of emphasis in, how, in what participation means. So it can mean so many different things. It, can, it is important that we don't just, you know, tokenistically kind of include people, but that we actually make sure that people understand exactly 
all the information, what is involved, and they have a, a kind of an equal and, and legitimate role in kind of the decision making of this, of this kind of um, design of technologies. Um, so it's a very democratizing and kind of empowering approach, but it is also very time consuming, of course. And it has a number of challenges about how do we go about, you know, encouraging more people to participate that or demand that they participate in our technologies. So how do we kind of, you know, uh, get people to move past the, the power dynamics that exist at the moment? Uh, and these are things that we often kind of deal with in the projects that we do, and you'll see a little bit about that afterwards. And then, like I said, the, the second kind of part of this change, this shift in how we design technology, is about focusing and prioritizing back our lived experience. So taking a more humanistic approach to the design of technology, kind of rethinking about the user as a person, as someone with a past, a present, and a future, someone that has you know this full kind of interaction with the world and it has to be that the technology and our approach to that is kind of meaningfully from a social a political and a personal kind of uh, perspective so so these are kind of like the first kind of ingredient which is about like i said changing how we approach the design of technology so in my digital future, I would like that everyone can participate in designing their own tech. I would, you would need to obviously encourage people to do that or help people demand that they are part of that. You need to think about how we can encourage more facilitation. How can we provide, pr present, uh, provide sorry, more opportunities that people can actually do that. People can participate in the design of technologies. And we need to think about how we can build more collaborations, how can we establish trust? Because a lot of these things take time. And I know all of you that, that work in this kind of space or have dealt with kind of engaging with communities, you know exactly what I mean. So um, then the next step is about this kind of turn to from the kind of the profit and the market innovation uh, to the grassroots innovation. So here is basically thinking about peer-to-peer -peer platforms and kind of thinking about how we can kind of again connect with each other, very similar to, I guess, the Culture Lab platform, but taking this to other, other levels, not just for kind of cultural participation. So this is a, a kind of a future in which citizens will take a more active role in kind of um, shaping agendas, making decisions about their services, and, and, uh, and how they're administered as well. And we have some of these um, kind of platforms already, quite a lot actually, and it was, I couldn't like present them all in the time that I have, but, um, but I will focus a little bit on a project that we are doing at the moment. This is also a European uh, funded project, and it is actually an innovation grant. So this is all kind of European funding talk, but what it really means is that uh, we were given money not to study people, uh, not to kind of look at uh, cultural participation of people, but to see that this technology can actually uh, be successful and can maybe make profit in some way or, or kind of be scaled up. But as you will see, this was not about innovation in that kind of classic sense of innovation. It was all about the people, and it is still all about the people, and this is kind of what we wanted to do from the beginning. So what we did is we, we kind of, this is a project that um, is aiming to um, give the opportunity to kind of isolated, physically, geographically isolated communities to participate, to set up their own kind of community radio, basically give voice to people and, and kind of uh, help them to reconnect maybe with kind of other communities with each other, but also um, um, kind of get information that they might need, exchange resources, etc. So it's a classic kind of almost communication platform if you think about it, or a media platform potentially. So, um, so we took the familiar kind of radio and we kind of uh, uh, turned it into this ICT kind of technological platform that basically it's a very simple, it's open source, uh, it's low cost, so uh, it costs kind of a fraction, I think it costs something like 500, well maybe 500 or 1000 euro, which is 
I'm told a fraction of what you need to buy professional radio equipment, basically consoles, etc. So, um, so it can fit in a bucket. It has a tiny transmitter and a, a phone. It's a smartphone, but it's a very uh, not smartphone, so it's not a very expensive one. And this is like a small antenna that comes with it. And of course, you can get a bigger antenna if you wanted to, but this will always work. And then all it needs, basically, is just this bucket and the antenna. And, and it actually uses a mini solar panel for, uh, for kind of charging. The reason that we opted for that kind of design is because sometimes a lot of the communities we work with, they might not have electricity, they might not have broadband. So using FM and using this kind of setup means that we can reach more people in more kind of challenged areas, which was exactly the goal of our project. So, um, so we gave uh, um, uh, two communities, so we have like four communities in three European countries, in uh, uh, Ireland, Romania, and Portugal. We gave them this kind of kit, basically, and we said, set up a radio station, set up a community radio station. We wanted to see what they will do. We wanted to see whether they'll find this useful or not, and we were fine if they didn't, but we wanted to see what they would do. Uh, and, and people, so I forgot to say that you have this transmitter and then every person of the community can actually call into that little kind of, you know, uh, smartphone there and broadcast their own show from anywhere, from their home, from the church, from the football thing. And actually, you don't even need to have a smartphone. The platform can call you on your landline. So it kind of completely lowers the barriers that we have in terms of like, you know, professional kind of studio making. So we have now, for the last few months, uh, four radio stations. There are two in Romania, in Vorvoro de Jos, and if I'm mispronouncing that, apologies, in uh, uh, Svantu Jorge. Uh, this is by the very border, uh, like the east border of Romania. The other one is a mountain area in Romania. Uh, Cural de Freyas, Freyras, <laughs> sorry, terrible. <laughs> but this is in Madeira and the Bear Island Community Radio. Um, so I want to just play, I think what would be more useful is if I play a quick kind of little clip um, for you, you to listen what like actually the what community is. It's just sorry. totally devastating. I always kind of look at suicide like addiction. It has. The incidence of suicide, no matter what age group it is, is just totally devastating. I always kind of look at suicide like addiction. It has no boundaries. 13th of July, races will start at 1 o'clock. We start with 5k at 1 o'clock and then 10 past 1, the 10k race is off. So, yeah, looking forward to the day and all we're hoping now for is a bit of good weather and we'll be flying. You went to the shop to buy groceries. You have to remember most people didn't have a car. So you went to the shop to buy groceries and you brought back, you know, a heavy bag of groceries. It was walking everywhere and carrying and nobody said, would that be too heavy for you? You just did it. Jack Sullivan, I was asked to do a country flick or country session today on Bear Island Radio. So delighted to be asked and delighted to be here to do it. And I suppose country is my thing. So I had to think about it and I figured that what I might do was a piece on the Bakersfield Sound. Bear Island Community Radio 100.1 FM Esta é a Rádio Comunitária do Corral das Freiras, 97.8. Uma rádio aberta para todos. Os programas começam dentro de alguns dias. Vamos dividir um pouco este, este, esta emissão em, em duas partes. Ainda estão a ouvir rádio no Corral das Freiras, 106 FM. Boa tarde, aqui temos a senhora... Arsénia. A senhora Arsénia. Uh, hoje é o dia, hoje é a festa da castanha, cá no, no Corral das Freiras. Senhor Jesus Cristo, vosso Filho, que é Deus convosco na unidade do Espírito Santo. Sara, tens um escadote que possas emprestar? Não, mas já tentaste anunciar na rádio. Não, como faço isso? Um velho e um rapaz iam por uma estrada levando na sua companhia um burro com os alforjes cheios de cereais para venderem na feira.
Radio Civic Sfântul Gheorghe A fost ora 6. Iată știrile. Sunt Claudia Titu și vă prezint știrile. Revista presei la Radio Civic Primul caz de infecție cu virusul West Nile din acest sezon a fost confirmat joi în Galați. Pilula de sănătate la Radio Civic Asistentul medical comunitar vă informează Radio Civic Publicitate Departamentul Taxe și Impozite Comuna Vârvoru de Jos Red Redavați rețetul Șciuca Nacineana Nacineana, da Memoria locului Radio Civic Bună seara Sfântul Gheorghe, bună seara Drașca I'm running out of time, so I'm going to pause it here. <laughs> so, as you can see, each of these communities, they did their own thing. Some of them had health kind of needs, you know, the health pill in kind of Romania. Some of them, they went to mass and they broadcasted for the elderly in the community that they couldn't go to the church. And, and some of them went to festivals and they kind of uh, broadcasted that to the diaspora, like in Portugal. And this was like the real power of that platform, that it was kind of adaptable and it was, um, sorry, and it gave the communities the power to do exactly what they wanted to. There was no restrictions, there was no kind of, you know, um, apart from some basic training on how to do radio, there was nothing else that was necessary. And, and we're still kind of obviously running it, and at the moment, um, the challenge is how do we sustain that? So I just wanted to say I don't have time, like I said, but there are other, other kind of platforms like that that support this kind of social solidarity. There's so many that are still kind of, you know, uh, either at their beginning or the middle, but the challenge for all of those and the challenge for this kind of second component of my digital future is kind of okay, I would love that everybody could build their own platform, but how do we sustain those platforms? And we need to start thinking about other models around kind of, you know, being able to, um, the, for the communities to get something back that are monetary maybe, but they're not kind of the classic monetary kind of uh, examples. And we need to think about kind of governance models that are speaking to the community level, and then kind of how this governance, so who is going to be running the radio in five years time? Who is going to be responsible if something goes wrong? How can they actually have income that, you know, the community is feeling rewarded maybe to another level apart from just their participation, but without kind of making it about profit, because that's not what this work and that's not what the communities are about. So these are kind of the challenges in terms of the grassroots innovation, uh, but other than that, we have most of what we need. We have these low-cost interlocking digital components. They're out there, they're everywhere. So we just have to kind of use them and think a little bit more about sustaining those. And last but not least, and I'll be, I'll try and be even quicker with that. Uh, so, it's about the third component, promoting kindness, promoting empathy. This is really important. I think our world is getting more and more violent in, in many ways. So I think being able to stop and think about those that are the most vulnerable around us is really important. I think if technology or any kind of design interventions can actually give us that pause or that connection that we can, you know, connect with each other, empathize with each other, get in each other's shoes and, and be able to kind of reconnect, that is, for me, that would be the biggest win. And this work, and again, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but as part of this work, uh, quite a lot of my students and myself, we do work with vulnerable populations. I work with some of the kind of young people at risk in probation, and a lot of my students, uh, two of my PhD students, work with people with dementia and advanced dementia. So we are really kind of thinking about people who are very vulnerable, maybe very kind of misunderstood. And that's kind of um, where technology and where design interventions, this experience and the design can really kind of help us uh, to stop misrecognizing people. So 
I just wanted to show very quickly a little bit from the work of Sarah. Sarah has done this ethnographic work. So she has been in a care home in Cork for the last three years volunteering. So uh, being part of the day-to-day -day life of a care home and people with dementia and advanced dementia. And what was very obvious to Sarah from the beginning almost was that these people were, like I said, misrecognized. They were not like treated as equal social beings. Their social identities had kind of completely disappeared. And for no reason, they were not, even though they had their moments, they were still fully functional social beings. So she made it kind of her purpose to change that kind of, you know, reconfigure that, that kind of recognition and that agency of those people. And as part of that, she first kind of started doing some work with them on a face-to-face, -face, but soon enough she realized that she had to kind of broaden that, broaden that participation. And she started bringing undergraduate students from our university to do kind of activities with the um, residents of the care home. What was interesting is that although the classic approach is we think the students are giving to those elderly, and that's how maybe it started, it was very clear from very early on that the residents had more to give to the students. So the residents started doing this kind of history club, teaching the students about the history of Cork. So these elderly people got a completely new role, being teachers, being now the ones that were guiding this social interaction. And through that, they went even further and they organized their own kind of quiz, um, pub quiz, let's say, within the care home. And a technology kind of uh, a low tech you see there was kind of developed to support that. It was a little kind of mini printer. So we're talking about very low tech technology, but that was something that the residents was relevant to them, was printing the questions and, and kind of helping them do that kind of quiz. And this was something they could share with their families and other people that were visiting them to showcase how they had this um, new experience and, and they were part, active kind of members of society again. So, and this is only a very small kind of thing. I think there's even more, um, um, sorry, there's even more, um, why this didn't work. Um, there's even more that can be done in this space and I, if I have time in the panel, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there's other things, I'm, I'm not a fan of virtual reality, but it is becoming actually much more low cost and it's becoming kind of more open source. And there's other work that is happening in dementia care and again in challenging that idea of like that, you know, virtual reality is only about time traveling and taking the, you know, the people with dementia back in the past. This was actually a work that challenged that and basically what it did is like created entertaining experiences like, you know, future experiences with the people with dementia that they could just have fun the same way we have and they were kind of the leaders of that. So, um, so with that, I just came to the last part. So I would like a digital, yeah. Sorry. Yes, no, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and I would like us to all think about what are the digital futures we would like to have. And, um, and hopefully, you know, we can have digital futures that, you know, technologies, everybody can build it, everybody can participate, and everybody can build it as if it is for the people we care and love the most. And thank you. <laughs>